and let me welcome our speaker for today. Our speaker this time is uh, Giuseppe Carleo, who is a computational quantum physicist. He obtained his PhD in 2011 from CISA in Trieste. He then held postdoctoral positions at the Institut d'Optique in Paris, ETH in Zurich, and also worked as a research scientist at the Flatiron Institute in New York. He is now a professor at the EPF in Lausanne and the head of the Computational Quantum Science Lab. And you can see Lake Geneva there in the background. His work focuses on the development of numerical methods to study many body quantum systems. I don't think I really need to tell you that this is a very difficult, but also a very rewarding problem to solve. So I'll leave it up to Giuseppe to tell us how machine learning turned out to be a game changer in this affair. So Giuseppe, please start whenever you're ready. Oh, thank you. So let's see. Okay, so thank you, uh, Philip, for the, for the introduction and uh, thank you for uh, having me here today virtually in Oxford. It's always a pleasure. Um, so today I'm going to, to give you um, an overview of, uh, of the applications that uh, we've been doing and also others have been doing in the context of uh, studying uh, many body quantum systems uh, and quantum computing with uh, machine learning techniques. Um, and I will also give you uh, a couple of um, ideas of what we've been, uh, what are the challenges in the field, and uh, what also some of the latest applications we've been uh, we've, we've done in the field. So, but the, the central uh, topic that I will uh, I will uh, talk about today is uh, essentially uh, related to many body one new science. So this is the the, the light motif of the of the talk, uh, and uh, I mean essentially, I mean before moving to the to the many body scenario i mean you know that uh, even if you have uh, uh, a single uh, isolated uh, spin so the simplest if you want the quantum uh, uh, system spin one half or uh, in a sense uh, a qubit uh, you know that the properties of this qubit are fully described by a wave function which is a linear superposition of the two basis states for example up or down or if you think of this as a schrodinger cut uh, it, would, it can be in a superposition of being dead or alive right and I mean, for a single qubit, this is relatively simple, in theoretical in the sense that um, the only thing that you need to describe the state are essentially these two coefficients, C up and C down, that characterize, for example, uh, if you take the square of these coefficients, the probability of observing respectively the spin up or down when you make a measurement of this, uh, of this uh, point, right? I mean, the situation, however, becomes, uh, you know, uh, rather uh, intricate uh, um, when you consider instead the, the many particles, many electrons, many spins in this uh, simple uh, scenario. Uh, because in that case, I mean, even um, conceptually, there is something that uh, uh, inevitable that happens, which is essentially one of the postulates of quantum mechanics. And the fact is that uh, now the state, psi, or wave function, uh, your, uh, your state vector is a superposition of exponentially many possible states. Um, and uh, if you want to describe uh, theoretically, if you want uh, the, the properties of this system, you will need in principle to know, uh, I mean, to, to infinite precision to some extent, all, all these two to the n coefficients. Um, and uh, to, to, to the point, to the extent that people like Walter Kahn was, you know, a famous Nobel laureate in, in chemistry, at some point uh, said that uh, the, this uh, state of n quantum particles is uh, essentially a monster or so something that we should really not even look at because I mean if you consider the case of a typical material essentially if you think in terms of coefficients or expansion of the wave function the complexity of this object is really uh, higher than the number of atoms that we have in the universe it's something that is really not uh, to some extent physical at least in his uh, in his words. Uh, I still believe that the wave function is a valid description of, the, of nature, uh, but it's clear that uh, this uh, uh, exponential complexity reflects in, in a lot of issues that we have uh, in, uh, in, in several fields, starting from chemistry to, to, to condensed matter physics, uh, but even quantum computing. Um, and for example, I mean, if you want to solve the shooting equation for the ground state of, of a given uh, Hamiltonian that describes interactions of your system, well, you know that in general, this is an exponentially hard problem. Uh, no matter how you solve it, even if you have a quantum computer, this is still an exponentially hard problem as far as we know. Um, and uh, 
you know, even uh, apart from this, uh, you know, standard classical problems, there are also other problems, more subtle, but they are still exponentially scaling, essentially because of this complexity of the wave function. For example, if you try to prepare a certain quantum state uh, with a quantum circuit, so if you have a quantum computer and your goal is to prepare a certain quantum state, then in general, for the most general state, we know that this task is exponentially complex, and this is again also a consequence of this uh, original proliferation of coefficients, if you want, in the, in the wave function. Um, but uh, I mean, uh, in general, I mean, and, and again, if you think about uh, even worse solving uh, problems uh, in condensed matter or in chemistry using classical computers, just in terms of storage, this is essentially uh, a hard problem because if you wanted to store the wave function of uh, you know, 54 qubits, you will need essentially all the memory of the largest supercomputer uh, we have uh, to date. And, uh, you know, if you want to store the wave function of uh, uh, a material or something that contains even more than 200 qubits, uh, then this is essentially impossible if you use uh, uh, classical storage essentially based on hard disk, right? because this is really an exponential work. However, I mean, the thing that we have to ask ourselves, I mean, this is in line uh, to some extent, uh, but from a different perspective to what, uh, with what uh, um, Walter Kahn was saying, we have to ask ourselves whether this complexity, so this nominal complexity is really exponential for the systems uh, we care about, right? So the physical systems we care about, the materials we care about, the molecules uh, we care about. Right? And uh, I mean, in this sense, I mean, this brings me to the notion of, um, somehow corners of, of the Hilbert space. Uh, and the idea is that uh, it's true that in general, your quantum state will be a generic vector uh, in a, a huge uh, Hilbert space of all possible uh, quantum states, so all the possible to the end coefficients if you want. However, it's also true that the cares, the, the states we, we care about are not in general random states in this uh, Hilbert space. So they have very well-defined properties because they are, for example, the ground state of physical Hamiltonian that are you know, electronic Hamiltonians uh, or Hamiltonians describing other phenomena that are not uh, essentially uh, random. Um, and this means that this is, we have uh, some simplification we can leverage in the sense that we can hope to describe a much smaller portion of this uh, extremely large space of possible quantum states that corresponds only to physical green states in this, in this notion. And uh, essentially, this is a problem that uh, arises in many other fields. So not only in, uh, I mean, of course, from a different perspective, but not only in quantum physics, we have this problem. So for example, I mean, in, uh, if you think of the problem of uh, um, classifying images in, in machine learning, which is you know, one of the standard uh, applications of machine learning, uh, it's clear that if you consider, for example, if you have an image, it's clear that if you consider the state of all the possible, the space state uh, of all the possible uh, uh, images that you have, two dimensional images of, of a certain size, so over a certain amount of pixels, this is also an exponentially large object, uh, much larger than the universe if you have a standard JPEG image that you can show on your, on your iPad. Um, but it's also true that uh, the, the states, or if you want, the images we care about uh, typically are not random peaks because uh, there is no way we can classify those. But uh, those are very well structured figures and pictures of people, dogs, or cats. So we can, this uh, somehow uh, dimensionality reduction is, uh, is, is at the core essentially of, uh, of uh, successful machine learning techniques that are leveraged uh, every day essentially in uh, applications in, uh, in, in industry. Now, and this is uh, essentially at the heart also of, uh, of our uh, idea that we introduced a few years ago, uh, which is this idea of introducing neural network uh, representations. So if you want the low dimensional representations of uh, these otherwise complex uh, quantum, uh, quantum states. Uh, this is what I, I call uh, um, neural network uh, quantum states that you can see in this slide. Um, and essentially here, the idea is that instead of storing, if you want, all these exponentially many body amplitudes, for example, again, for a spin one half, this will be two to the n, uh, we have a black box, uh, in this case, a neural network that uh, computes uh, the, the many body amplitudes uh, uh, on request. So essentially, I give you as an input to the, this neural network a bunch of quantum numbers that can be, for example, plus or minus one if you are working with spins, spin one half, uh, plus or minus one half 
um, and we are uh, working uh, with, uh, with uh, discretized uh, quantum seeds, quantum numbers, but this can be generalized also to continuous quantum numbers. And the idea is that I have this black box, so I'm never storing, if you want, these 2 to the n uh, coefficients. And I use uh, a neural network to compute, to find an approximation of this neural net of these coefficients. Uh, and uh, the, the typical approximations that we use, uh, even though they, these are not the only possibilities, but they are based on neural network uh, uh, functions. So a neural network, a deep network, is nothing but a composition, uh, as you know, I mean, I'm, sure, I'm sure you've seen already this during this uh, series of seminars. It's a composition of linear and nonlinear transformations, layer by layer. And this is what I've written here in compact form, where you start from your uh, uh, initial state vector of S, so S now is a vector of these quantum numbers. You apply linear transformation, parameterized by some parameter W. You convolve it, I mean, you actually, you, you apply component-wise a, a nonlinearity, then you apply nonlinearity, a linear, nonlinear, etc. until you reach the output, so the final layer of this, um, of this network, that in this case is just uh, one number, it's actually in general a complex number, which is also something funny about applying neural networks to quantum uh, systems. But in principle, you know, we have a compact representation which is entirely parameterized by these parameters W and essentially also the structure of, of the network. Okay. Now, I mean, uh, as you know, I mean, uh, and, uh, this kind of parameterization that in practice work very well and uh, for industrial applications are very powerful at describing uh, classifying uh, cats and dogs. Uh, they also have some mathematical guarantees. So, I mean, I'm citing two here that are, uh, I think, uh, relatively well known. Uh, I mean, one is a standard result from uh, Sibenko saying that essentially if you enlarge sufficiently, um, uh, if you take, for example, a single layer network and you take it sufficiently wide, so, so a large width shallow network, then you know that you can represent uh, essentially any uh, any reasonable function a high dimensional function if you take the number of neurons in this in this, uh, in this network to be sufficiently large also there's uh, the counterpart of this theorem which is a bit more recent that says that tells you that if you take uh, a fixed width uh, deep network so now instead of uh, growing it horizontally we grow it in, in depth you can also approximate an arbitrary essentially a dimensional function uh, and uh, you know these results uh, carry over also to, um, to, of course, to quantum states in the sense that uh, the wave function is nothing but a high-dimensional uh, wave fu function. So it's clear that if we take a sufficiently large uh, network, where sufficiently large might be in the worst case exponentially large uh, network, we can in principle approximate any uh, quantum wave function. However, I mean there are more stringent results uh, that, uh, for example, concern uh, the representability of states that are uh, uh, relevant for physics. So I'm, I'm not giving you a full uh, account of all the possible states that uh, people have uh, discovered that are representable in terms of neural networks, uh, of small neural networks. Small means uh, polynomially sized uh, neural networks. But for example, if you take famous states like uh, Laughlin states, uh, just row states, so these are typical wave functions carrying the names of people who have been introduced to find uh, to describe a specific phenomena, for example, after states are very famous for topological properties. And, and you can show that there are constructions, efficient construction in terms of neural network that allow you to write these states uh, exactly, essentially, using uh, small uh, artificial uh, neural networks. Um, and I mean, a slightly more general result concerns also the fact that if you have, um, for example, a deep neural network, like a convolutional neural network, like one that you see here, so a common net, uh, I'm sure you know, but this is essentially the case where you take these filters to be short range instead of fully connected and you stack them uh, in a sequence of uh, layers. Well, it's known that in this case, you can uh, efficiently encode, for example, volume law uh, entanglement. So volume law entanglement means that you can, in principle, for example, describe um, uh, typically high energy states that are, for example, uh, that emerge at finite temperature or even uh, uh, critical states or long-term dynamics of, of, of some uh, quantum uh, system. So at least, I mean, we know that there exist uh, wave functions that, in, that are polynomially side that they can describe this kind of uh, uh, traditionally hard uh, states uh, in, a, in, a compact, uh, in a compact way. Now, um, 
once we have uh, a, uh, a um, ansatz somehow for, for the wave function it's clear that we can do several things with these ansatz uh, and uh, this is uh, somehow the, the, the learning part so if you want the machine part is the the, uh, the description of the wave function in terms of, uh, of neural networks now we need to learn the parameters in the neural network we need to to find the best parameters that uh, solve a certain task we are interested in in quantum uh, in quantum science and essentially, in all the applications I'm going to describe uh, in the following, um, all the tasks are well described in terms of uh, uh, what we can call an expectation minimization problem, which is very common in, uh, in uh, standard machine learning. So the idea is that you have a loss function that depends in general on all the parameters of your neural network and you want to minimize this loss function. Okay? Um, and uh, I mean, typically, we, we, we write this loss function as the expectation value over some probability distribution that in general also depends on, on the parameters of some uh, per sample uh, loss that is uh, this, this, this L uh, that, that I've written here. So I will give you specific examples of this learning uh, uh, somehow framework, but in general, I mean, all the somehow learning that will be performed in the, in the following is of this form. So we have uh, some uh, neural network that contains a lot of parameters and we want to minimize expectation values over probability. And both the, the, the thing that we are averaging and the probability can depend in general on the parameters of the neural network. So just to give you I mean, an overview at this point, there will be essentially two scenarios and I, I will focus on in, in the following. So there is a first scenario in which um, essentially uh, I don't have external data. So for example, imagine the problem of finding the ground state of a given Hamiltonian. And in this case, the probability that, uh, that appears here is nothing but uh, the, the actual the, the wave function square. So this, in this case, you can see that it depends explicitly on the parameters because this is uh, also parameterized by, by a neural network. However, there are other cases where uh, instead I have a stationary probability in the sense that this, this will not depend in general from, from the neural network parameters. And this is the case which is essentially much closer to the standard application of uh, machine learning, uh, at least not uh, I mean, uh, up to reinforcement learning, so let's say unsupervised and, uh, and supervised learning, in the sense that I have a lot of data, uh, this is a data-driven approach, um, and the data is distributed with this probability. So in this case, I have a stationary probability and I will try to learn my wave function from this data. So since, uh, I mean, this is a scenario which is closer maybe to what you've already heard uh, during this series of seminars, I will start from this one and then I will, uh, I will move to the second uh, and to the other scenario, which is a bit more complicated uh, from the machine learning perspective. So the data-driven scenario um, is uh, essentially the following. So I have a representation of my quantum state in terms of, uh, of neural networks. How can I learn, uh, uh, how can I, uh, if you want to match these parameterizations from, uh, for example, results that I have from an experiment. So what are the experiments that I have in mind here? So for example, I have in mind things like um, uh, quantum gas microscopy experiments that can be performed in, uh, uh, with uh, ultra cold atoms or, or I have in mind uh, uh, even uh, quantum computers. So in all these uh, settings, you can, what you do is that you can perform a so-called projective measurement of your system in the sense that every time you image the system, for example, with a microscope, you will find that your atoms are sitting here, here, or there, and these are really like individual atoms in your, in your uh, system. And uh, of course, since uh, quantum mechanics is probabilistic, every time you repeat this measurement, you will find a different outcome for the, the positions of your, of your atoms. And what we know from the postulates of quantum mechanics is that these positions, for example, in this case, will be uh, distributing according to, to psi square or phi square in this, uh, now I change notation which is essentially the wave function of, of the system, okay? Um, now, uh, an important uh, difference, I mean, an important feature, if you want, of quantum mechanics is that we can perform measurements in different bases. So instead of measuring, for example, only in the sigma z basis, uh, as we, we are doing, for example, in the case of, uh, uh, or in the position basis, as we are doing for, for electrons or for, uh, for, for ultra cold atoms, we could, for example, in, image the system in momentum basis, so measure the velocities of the system, or a composition of the two uh, bases, right? And typically, this is important because it will give access not only to the square of the wave function, but also to information about the, the, the phase of the wave function, right? That otherwise would be 
impossible to infer just from these images. So this is the concept of the tomography in, uh, in uh, for example, in quantum optics or in quantum computing. Uh, and this is what we also used in, in this paper somehow to, to, to learn our wave functions. So the idea is that uh, I obtain measurements, I, take, I obtain images, snapshots of my system in different bases B that I have access to, for example, in, in, in my microscope. Uh, and then what we do is that uh, we try to match this uh, probability distribution in all the different bases I have access to uh, in my experiment. And uh, essentially, each uh, wave function in the different bases is just a unitary rotation of the wave function in the, in the main basis, uh, in the so-called computational basis. So these are objects that typically can be computed, uh, uh, in most cases, efficiently. Uh, and then at the end, uh, so this is a typical unsupervised learning scenario in the sense that uh, I have uh, data from, uh, probability, from a probability distribution, and I'm trying to learn how to reproduce this data that comes from this, this unknown probability distribution. So I'm trying to, if you want to fit this unknown probability distribution of which I only know data uh, that has been uh, sampled from this probability with some uh, model distribution which is fit, which is uh, parameterized by some parameters W. Okay. And uh, so this mathematically, this in practice is done in all the uh, machine learning uh, settings, uh, minimizing the, the Kullback-Leibler divergence which is essentially a measure of the uh, relative entropy between the, the exact distribution and uh, the approximate one. So essentially when this object uh, attains a minimum, it means that we are uh, describing our data in, in the best possible way. Now, just to give you an example, why do we care about this? Well, first of all, because if you want to characterize quantum hardware, the standard techniques uh, that existed uh, that are still used in, uh, often in the field, uh, which is called uh, state tomography, um, require a lot of measurements that scale essentially exponentially with the number of, of system of, of particles, number of, of spins that you have in your system. So if you take, for example, a very simple state that co contains uh, eight spins, if you want to describe, uh, if you want to infer the wave function from measurements, uh, in this paper in 2005, they, they did a, really an epic series of, uh, of, of measurements. They took like one million uh, measurements in I don't know how many days. To, to reconstruct the wave function of only eight spins, which is you know, not a very large system. Um, and uh, this gives you a sense of how these techniques, standard techniques scale exponentially with system sites, uh, because they are essentially doing histograms of the wave function, and this is not scaling uh, very, very nicely. However, I mean, if we do the same with our technique based on uh, neural networks, we can describe with uh, high fidelity, so this is the fidelity, um, some prototypical state, the same that we're discussing here, uh, with a number of measurements that is, uh, you know, more affordable even for much larger systems. So if you take 80 spins, something that cannot be done uh, with this, uh, older approaches, you would, uh, you would take it, it would take us uh, something around 10 to the four or, or so measurements to describe the same uh, the same system. This is a simple state, by, by the way. So also that's the reason why we only need a few measurements to describe. But still, this is advantageous because it allows you to characterize quantum hardware that otherwise you wouldn't be able to, to, to characterize explicitly. And it also allows you to, um, to measure other quantities that you were not able to measure directly in experiment. So the idea here is that um, if I have a parameterization of the wave function that I've obtained uh, uh, learning the wave function from experimental data, now what I can do is that I can uh, use this parameterization on my, if you want, classical computer to measure uh, other quantities, other functions, uh, other observables that I couldn't measure directly in the quantum hardware. Right? So for example, one uh, typical example is the entanglement entropy, which is something uh, theoretically important uh, for, for some applications, but that is very hard to measure experimentally. The record is for a few uh, particles where it has been directly measured. And instead, uh, with, with, with this approach, where you have a, a reconstruction of the state, you can infer this entanglement entropy for a much larger system that you can, uh, of order 20 in this case, that you can do directly uh, on, the, on, the, on the hardware. So this is also a way if you want to extend the capabilities of the hardware to some extent. Okay. Now, uh, the other application, which also goes in, in, uh, in this direction, which is uh, a newer application, um, it goes in, in, uh, in the direction of also improving the quantum uh, applications, uh, quantum algorithms uh, that, that, that are run uh, on some specific hardware, for example, on uh, IBM quantum computers or 
on Google uh, hardware, etc., that are still uh, uh, not that large. So if we can give them, uh, if we can help them and, uh, and run uh, more smoothly, this would be also an advantage for, for them. So what is the problem there? So the problem there is that, uh, uh, in a nutshell, if you consider, for example, one of the most uh, studied uh, quantum uh, variational quantum uh, techniques that are used to implement on the quantum hardware, which is the VQE approach. Uh, it is, the details are not too important, but the idea is that uh, what you do there is that you prepare through a quantum circuit um, a certain uh, final state that depends in general on some parameters theta that are the nodes that you have in this quantum circuit. And then at the end, in this kind of applications, for example, you are interested in measuring the expectation value over this quantum state that you have prepared in the hardware uh, of some uh, observable. So for example, imagine that you want to, to, to estimate the expectation value of a Hamiltonian, so of an energy on the quantum state that you've prepared in, uh, in, uh, with your quantum hardware. Uh, and uh, essentially, this, this can be done just using, uh, again, measurements on your quantum system. Uh, and you can do uh, typically a few of them uh, efficiently. Uh, however, I mean, the problem, um, this is actually a serious bottleneck for these applications, is that um, if you want to obtain very precise estimates of the, of the energy, for example, in this digital quantum computing setting, because that's the, the, the key of the, of the problem, if you want to. Then, I mean, typically, if you want to resolve the energy, for example, uh, with an accuracy that is interesting for chemistry, typically uh, the so-called chemical accuracy, then uh, even for very simple systems, and I will give you an example in the following, you, it, this would take like several millions of, of measurements, you know. We are back to the millions of measurements that you had to do uh, to some extent for tomography, even though this scales better, but still, I mean, uh, the, the issue at play here is that the Hamiltonian has a lot of terms and you have to estimate them essentially one by one. So how can we help with this problem uh, in this kind of applications? Well, the idea that we did in collaboration with, uh, with, uh, with IBM in this case uh, was that uh, we, we can use these neural network tomographies to, to, to provide an approximate reconstruction of the quantum state um, and then uh, we can measure the energy on the classical hardware. So, so essentially we are trading uh, um, a smaller uh, variance that we, we can achieve using this parameterized version of the quantum state, which is again, not the most general state, but the physical state. Because that's also what we are trying to prepare on the quantum hardware with, uh, with some bias. So we, we, for example, if we want to measure the energy, uh, we will have the tower, the error that we measure with the, with the the neural network, the, the, the Amazon that we measure with the neural network, we want to be the exact one that we, we are trying to measure. We'll have some bias, so this is represented by this arrow here, but the variance of these distributions so or the blue distribution will be much more peaked, so also the error that we will make will be much smaller. Uh, and with this, we will, so, and if, you know, if the, this bias is smaller than the accuracy that we want to achieve, then uh, this will be an improvement also in terms of measurements that we have to perform on the quantum hardware. So uh, this works, I mean, uh, we've shown that it works for a few quantum chemistry problems. Uh, uh, this shows, for example, uh, what happens to the, to the, to the dissociation energy course uh, when you increase the number of samples. Uh, so the, 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 these points are the, the results that you obtain with neural networks. And these are instead the error bars that you will get with standard uh, measurements. From this plot, it's not too clear, but if you look at, for example, what is the probability of hitting chemical accuracy with uh, a certain uh, a number of measurements uh, with the standard approach. So for example, uh, uh, so these are the continuous line. You would say that even for relatively small molecules, for example, H2, and if you take a sufficiently large basis set, uh, it, it would take you essentially a number of measurements, which is in uh, almost in the 10 to the eight, if you want to achieve uh, a chemical accuracy on a very simple molecule, which is H2. Okay? So this is really a problem for these kind of applications. Instead, if we you know, try to help them, uh, maybe paying some bias, but still having a slower, a lower variance, using you know, much smaller number of measurements, you know, in this case, there's uh, you know, all three or almost four orders of magnitude reduction in the number of measurements, we can get essentially the same precision, but with less measurement. Again, we are paying the bias because we are approximating the state, but this is, an example of where machine learning can help quantum computing also in reducing the, the, the budget in terms of measurements that you have to pay when you, when you do this kind of, of applications. 
Okay, now, I mean, uh, um, this was uh, the, the first part, essentially, uh, of this, of my learning paradigm, where I, I what I do is that I, uh, I have data from experiments and I use this data to learn, so to get a, a representation of my wave function, which is parameterized by neural networks. Now, let's move uh, uh, to the second part, which is about simulating one of systems. Um, and uh, there are several applications, and uh, I won't cover uh, all of them because uh, it would be impossible, but all of them are based on, uh, on the variational principle. Uh, so both to find ground states, unit dynamics, or simulated dynamics. I'm just putting here some references. Um, what I will do in the following is that I will concentrate mostly on the problem of the ground state search, because that's somehow also easier to, to understand conceptually. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, my loss function uh, quite naturally is the, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. So again, my, for example, I imagine that I want to find the ground state of a given Hamiltonian. So I can rewrite the expectation value of the Hamiltonian as a loss function that depends now on the parameters that I have in the, in the wave function. And I can convert, and this is uh, thanks to uh, courtesy of uh, Bill Macmillan, who in the 60s uh, already discovered this uh, wonderful connection. I can convert this quantum expectation value into a statistical expectation value over psi square, which is, uh, if you want, a, a classical or effective probability distribution, the Born distribution, that is uh, parameterized in, in our case by, by a, a neural network. Okay? And the, 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 the energy that you, that you have to average, the class, effective classical energy that you have to average is called uh, the, the local energy. Um, I'm not uh, going too much into the detail of how, how this local energy looks like, but essentially it is uh, uh, something that can be efficiently computed and depends only on the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian. So if you know the Hamiltonian, I can also compute efficiently, typically to log it. Now, I mean, uh, just to give an example of how this, uh, this, uh, this learning works, uh, I mean, uh, to give you applications, uh, example applications of this approach, uh, one family of, uh, of models we've been working on uh, lately as and also other people who are trying this, uh, this, this kind of approaches are first set spin models. So these are two-dimensional um, spin models uh, that are not solvable exactly with any numerical uh, approach. Um, for example, if you try to do quantum Monte Carlo techniques, uh, this model would have the same problem, so it wouldn't be solvable exactly. If you try to do tensor networks, uh, uh, this is a two-dimensional problem, so there are entanglement issues and the contraction issues if you use PEPs. So there is a lot of um, um, uh, debate around this problem, essentially because it cannot be solved exactly with any technique we know of. Uh, and one debate would exist is essentially whether there is a, a disordered phase that arises uh, between the, the two extremes where the two um, uh, interactions among the nearest neighbor's uh, spins on the square lattice and the next to your neighbor spins on the, on the square lattice uh, have the same order of magnitude. So the issue is whether there is a so-called disorder the spin liquid free. Now, I mean, uh, without uh, giving you too, much, too many details, but uh, what we did uh, was to use uh, convolutional quantum states, so uh, wave functions that are described by deep networks uh, and where your filters are short range. So these are very popular and used a lot in uh, in uh, uh, image recognition, and the idea is that uh, in the physical in the physics setting is that these wave functions are also nice because they can be made very naturally, for example, translational invariant. So they have, uh, for example, you can easily impose uh, periodic boundary uh, conditions. Now, to give you an idea of uh, how well these things perform in practice, uh, I can you I can uh, I can give you uh, uh, a comparison with the early results that we obtained in 2016 using shallow neural networks. So these are the RBM results in our first paper where we used just one layer of, of, of uh, one layer neural networks, and, uh, but these were long range, so these are these restricted Boltzmann machines. And this was the limit where we take J2 equal to zero, the Eisenberg model, um, and this is the energy that you, the error you make on the error on the ground state uh, um, as a function of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the, of the uh, essentially of the weave of, of the network, okay? Uh, and uh, at that time, we were able to achieve an accuracy of the order of 10 to the minus 3 or so. Now, if we go deeper, so if we use these uh, components that have uh, four or five layers, so these are not super deep uh, neural networks, you, you get here, so in the 10 to the minus 4, so almost uh, um, 
a one order of magnitude improvement. And if you go actually deeper, so if we, in this paper, that's a recent development, uh, and you use, for example, uh, what we call autoregressive states uh, that allow us to exploit more efficiently uh, actual deep networks, you get and you get an accuracy which is you know, well beyond what could be done before, and it's uh, it's independent minus five. So at this point, essentially, you get an act, an act almost all purposes uh, exact description of the wave function of, of this uh, interacting two dimensional system. But I mean, coming back to the problem where we, we introduce uh, J2 now, so where we introduce uh, uh, this frustration, which is the, where the, uh, we, we, we break somehow the, the exact uh, possi the possibility of solving this problem exactly, for example, with, uh, with Quando Monte Carlo. Well, when we, we turn on J2, the only thing that we can do is to compare our energies to other techniques that are variational. For example, uh, matrix progress states, DMRG, or uh, uh, other variational approaches based on fermionic wave functions. Uh, and in general, what I'm plotting here is the difference of energy between our CNN uh, results and uh, the original uh, and the, these other approaches. That, uh, and this model has been studied for over 20 years, so it's really a very hard problem. And, uh, uh, there is no uh, total consensus on the phase diagram. And you can see that on almost the phase diagram, we get energies that are better, typically, in the sense that are lower than these other approaches. However, there, are, there is a region, uh, typically in the middle here on the spectrum of, of this J2, where our approach, this NQS, you know, the quantum states, is still not uh, as accurate as, as much as we would like. Um, the main reason why this is the case uh, is related to, to the fact that uh, uh, we have uh, essentially um, uh, a few issues that are related to the um, mostly to the symmetry. So one issue that we that, that is known for these neural network quantum states is to, to up to this point is that, for example, we don't know how to impose it efficiently S two symmetry uh, in uh, two dimensional uh, systems, um, and also. Um, one other reason is that uh, in the presence of frustration, the number of samples that you need to describe these systems can become quite large. So in this sense, we are limited by these two factors, but both factors, you know, is something that can be improved. And we believe that in the, in the near future, we should be able also to, to get essentially state of the art on all of the phase diagram of this model. Now, um, in the last uh, few minutes, uh, I wanted also to give you a more recent uh, uh, application of these ideas, I mean, even though this is uh, still uh, 2019, but more recent, uh, um, which is about uh, uh, another kind of simulation that uh, I, we also care about uh, in, uh, in this framework, uh, which is about simulating, if you want, classically. Uh, you know, I have this neural network. And now my goal would be to simulate classically a quantum circuit. So if you want, I would like to, to emulate as much as possible um, uh, a quantum computer using a, a classical neural network. So without ever building, if you want, the, the, the quantum computer. Right? So, and the, the task is um, then uh, to reproduce, if you want, to approximate a quantum circuit classically. And what we can ask is how far can we go? So essentially, how big are the systems we can simulate and what are the circuits that we can simulate? So this is uh, the, 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 essentially the, the, the things that you need to do when you have a quantum circuit. So the thing that you have to do is to, um, to, to, to be able uh, to, to approximate a sequence, the action of the several building blocks that are called quantum gates in quantum computing. Quantum computing, for example, we, we know that if you are able to approximate the action of these three building blocks, so for example, single qubit rotations, other markets, two qubit control Z rotations. Well, then you are able to simulate an arbitrary uh, quantum uh, algorithm. Uh, and uh, then, I mean, uh, it can be shown, uh, this is done, for example, in this paper of ours, that uh, if you try to apply uh, these, uh, these, um, um, these uh, gates on, uh, for example, a simple neural network that, that has only uh, one, uh, one layer, so for example, an RBM, uh, almost all of these layers of, of these gates can be applied exactly. Exactly means that uh, you get out another network which is not too large compared to the initial uh, starting network. Um, the only, I mean, even uh, including entangling gates, which are, uh, I mean, less trivial. But the thing that happens is that if you try to apply Hadamard gate, which is a superposition gate, then uh, you won't be able to describe uh, the final state, so the output state, exactly as an artificial neural network. So this is the 
the origin of the, of, of the issue, if you want, in, uh, in, in this problem. Uh, but what we can do, and it is also somehow at the heart of this uh, loss function approach that I've been discussing so far, uh, is that we can use a variational approach. So essentially, every time we want to apply this uh, complicated, uh, for us, Hardamar gate, uh, instead of applying it exactly, since we cannot represent, if you want, the state phi uh, with a neural network, if uh, my initial state is this psi w, which is a neural network, well, what we do is that we can try to approximate this final state phi as much as possible with another neural network that has, in general, some other weights w prime, okay? So this is now my variational principle. So I will try to match these two states, for example, minimizing some distance between these two states that can be typically the, the infidelity or the fidelity, if you want. Uh, I, I will maximize the fidelity, okay? So um, just to give you an idea of what we can do, uh, in, I mean, this was uh, the, the first paper that we did on this approach, uh, but uh, I mean, uh, for example, the, the Hadamard transform, which is a simple circuit where you perform a Hadamard on each qubit, um, and the initial state was taken to be a strong, highly entangled initial state, for example, the ground state of a 1D or 2D uh, correlated model uh, at the critical point, then, uh, I mean, we showed that you can get uh, fairly good fidelities uh, as you progress in the, in, the, in the circuit. So this is essentially when you start your, your, your circuit and then this is at the end of the circuit. And overall, the fidelities that you get are uh, in the 95, 96 uh, also, uh, which is a pretty good uh, number. Um, in the sense that, uh, for example, you can compare this, uh, this, uh, this fidelity that we get, so this uh, level of approximation that we can achieve with the variational state to what you can perform on the actual uh, quantum hardware, um, where you will also not be able to prepare exactly the, the output state that you, that you want, but for, a, for another reason, which is different. And the reason there is that you have noise. So in, in, on the quantum hardware, you are not exactly executing the gates you are expected to execute. You also have uh, decoherence because you have coupling with, your, with the environment. So you will have some intrinsic noise level on the hardware that can be you know, modeled, for example, with this depolarization noise. Uh, and what we can do essentially is that we can compare the, 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 the noise, uh, so to speak, that we have, that, but it's not noise, it's essentially a variational error that we have in our system to the noise uh, that you have on the hardware. And I mean, for this circuit that we studied, and this is not a general uh, somehow theorem, but uh, an application that we did, you can see that uh, if you want to achieve the same accuracy that we have on the, on the, on the, um, in, uh, in, uh, with the RBM, which is this, uh, this uh, vertical line, again, this is a very simple uh, mind neural network. Using better neural networks, you can improve the, the, this, uh, this figure. But essentially, the, the noise level that you have on the hardware is of the order 10 to the minus 3, which is, you know, a, a pretty relatively low noise uh, if, if compared with, uh, with modern uh, hardware. So essentially, if you take a neural network, you can get a quantum computer, which for these applications has a noise level which is better or uh, comparable to what you get uh, these days on, uh, in, uh, out there for, for quantum systems. Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, this can be generalized and we've, we've used this also to more complicated circuits than just a single uh, Hadamard transform. Uh, there is this technique that is called uh, QAOA. It's a complex circuit. I'm, I won't go into the details because this is not uh, a quantum computing uh, um, meeting, but uh, this is essentially also a very interesting circuit because it's, uh, it's supposed to be one of the earlier applications where you can uh, try to solve uh, a classical optimization problem using a quantum computer. So the question that we asked was, uh, can we simulate this classically without building a quantum computer? Um, the answer is that for some uh, circuits, uh, for some um, problems, uh, uh, we show that we can do this uh, quite accurately. Um, uh, for example, uh, what I'm showing here is this cost function, which is essentially what you try to get out of these quantum circuits as a function of the, of the parameters in the, in, the, in the quantum circuit. And uh, we, we, we can match uh, what can be done uh, on, the, on the exact circuit, which is this, uh, this blue line uh, with, uh, with our RBM, which is again a very simple neural network. Um, but uh, of course, this is not a general statement. It says that there are cases where our fidelity drops. Uh, for example, uh, when you go uh, in some regimes of these circuits that are uh, too random, for example, to be described by the neural network, but I mean, in general, um, I, I would argue that uh, 
in the regimes that are uh, meaningful for the applications of these quantum techniques, uh, a classical neural network, I mean, uh, until now, um, is enough to describe uh, or, or to do even better than most hardware that is implemented uh, out there in, uh, in, um, you know, in, in the labs that, that implement that have quantum math. Um, so, for example, this is a simulation that we did for 54 qubits, um, and you know, as far as we know, there is no um, there is no way to simulate this uh, efficiently with other approaches. For example, if you compare this to to neural network simulation, um, tensor network simulations, you can show that essentially to to simulate the same uh, circuits with the same uh, accuracy that you have um, with these simple neural networks, you will need uh, a tensor network, so an MPS, which is uh, extremely large. Um, with a bond dimension for, for the expert in the audience of 10 to 5, uh, which is typically not manageable uh, in a reasonable amount of times. So this is just to say that uh, typically uh, we can exploit the fact that this, these uh, states can encode uh, large amount of entanglements to describe some states. So for example, states that come out of these uh, complex quantum circuits that are typically not uh, efficiently, at least, describable by other states, for example, like tensor networks, that instead are typically limited by, by, by entanglements. Okay, so with this, I, 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 I will conclude. Uh, I will just flash here a slide on, on the software that we use and that we develop uh, here now at EPFL. Um, it's called NetCat. If you're interested, you can have a look at this. It's in Python and it allows you to uh, to express your learning tasks in quantum physics using uh, complex uh, values, uh, typically uh, neural networks. Um, uh, and uh, there is a lot of open challenges in the field. Uh, I think that one of the most uh, uh, important uh, challenges from a theoretical point of view is essentially to understand, to better understand uh, how complex and are the states that we can learn using uh, wave functions. So this is a wider problem if you want, but uh, uh, I think that in the context of quantum physics, it's really something that we should try to, uh, to understand from the point of view of perspective or quantum perspective. Um, and uh, I think that in this sense, uh, we should try to find a, a measure of complexity. So essentially quantify how complex is a quantum states that goes beyond, uh, for example, entanglement entropy, which is a measure that is usually used in the community. Uh, and uh, because entanglement entropy, as we've seen, is not a limiting factor, at least in theory, to describe uh, um, a quantum state with a neural network, so there must be some other measure of complexity that enters the game, but this is still largely unknown, I have to say. And uh, from the theoretical point of view, this is uh, a little bit uh, um, unsatisfactory. So it will, it will be very important to work on this theoretical uh, problem. And you know, a little bit provoc this is a provocatory statement if you want something that uh, I wonder is whether we can replace it entirely if you want quantum computers uh, uh, with uh, classical neural networks to, uh, to simulate useful uh, quantum uh, algorithms, uh, not only this uh, QLA but also others. So to what extent this is true and how far can we go? I would say that this is completely wide open and there's only a few works on this, and uh, it would be interesting to extend this uh, a lot uh, uh, beyond what has already been done. And you know, there's a lot of other problems, uh, mostly related with symmetries. Uh, I didn't even discuss about fermions, but this is an exploding field where there's a lot of uh, contributions that have been done uh, in, uh, in, the, in the past years uh, in, uh, in the field. So thank you. I would be happy to, to take uh, questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks a lot, Giuseppe. That was really, really interesting. Thanks a lot. Uh, questions. If people have questions, then please either raise your hand or write them in the chat window and I'll read them out for you. Yes, Henrik, please go ahead. Right. So uh, I think all the systems you showed were uh, finite, like a finite amount of qubits, right? I was wondering if you can simulate something in the thermodynamic limit where you can uh, like get some kind of momentum uh, resolution in some sense. Um, you see what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, so this is a, an excellent question. Uh, um, so there is a technique, uh, so people doing tensor networks do that uh, all the time. So they have a way to extrapolate their tensor networks to, uh, to infinite dimension. Um, so sorry, to infinite uh, number of qubits if you want, especially in 1D uh, and 2D also. Um, uh, 
Right, I think this is possible actually also for deep networks, but nobody has done this so far. So if you want to work on that, <laughs> that's a great topic, I think. Yeah, but uh, um, I think it's possible, but this has not been done so far. Yeah. yeah, I also have a question on when you spoke about state tomography. Is there, is there a way to sort of turn the game around and do tomography on, on the Hamiltonian instead? So assuming that you yeah. know that your Hamiltonian is supposed to be of a class with certain three parameters that then you want to estimate given, say, a sample of measurements. Yeah. Is there, is there any efforts in these directions? Yeah, so there is a field uh, called Hamiltonian learning, which, is, uh, which goes uh, in the direction a little bit of what you're saying. So what we've done uh, is recently mm, uh, with Giacomo Dorlai and others, uh, I didn't put the, the reference here, but is that we, we try to solve a, a, a more general problem than that, which is, um, which is this uh, uh, gate tomography. Um, so essentially there you try to, to, to learn what is the, 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 the transformation that, uh, that has um, a ge genetic transformation we can be, which can be unitary or actually even not, not non-unitary. Uh, and in that case, uh, yeah, these ideas can be generalized. It's a bit tricky, to be honest, <laughs> uh, because you have to work uh, with Choi matrices and other um, bits. Uh, but uh, yes, so in principle, you can use that uh, to, for example, to characterize how good are the gates um, that, you have, you have, that you have implemented in your uh, quantum hardware, which is a, a key problem in uh, characterizing and understanding uh, essentially how well the, the hardware is performing. So this can be done, but again, this, uh, this set of tomography uh, is, uh, this kind of tomography is much more expensive. And uh, to be clear, this cannot be performed on 100 qubits. I mean, at least not in the general setting yet, but uh, we hope to improve that. Yeah. So it's expensive in terms of the number of samples that you would need? Be uh, it's expensive to... because you have to work with a density matrix uh, in the, mm -hmm. instead of a wave function and you have to perform some operations that are a bit uh, complicated to, 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 yeah, so you have to work with P, P of VMs. So yeah, they're, they're essentially, uh, yeah, you have to work with in a larger space uh, where performing the elementary operations is more complicated than, than what we do. So the complexity is the square essentially of what we have here for the standard. Yeah, I see. Yeah. I see. And you also hinted at it a bit during your talk, and then you put it again on this slide, that the problem with symmetries. Like you said before, that there wasn't a good way to have some continuous symmetry implement or hardwired into the network. Yeah. And, and, and here you, you write fermions. So maybe, maybe that's a hint as to the, I don't know, spin statistics of your, of your particles that you have in your mini body system. Can, can you say a bit more about what the problem is with, with symmetries? Or with Fermi, yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a slide about that. But uh, the, the, the issue is that, uh, mm, uh, yeah, if you have fermions, you know that if you exchange uh, two particles, you want your wave function to, to, to acquire a minus sign, right? So this is an intrinsic symmetry that you have to enforce also in your wave function uh, in neural network. So there are several ways of doing that. Uh, some of them have been explored also in, uh, you know, in London by DeepMind uh, recently. Um, so, and yeah, the problem is really enforcing this uh, anti-symmetric uh, uh, nature of the wave function uh, in the neural network. So this is a highly non-trivial problem. There are some uh, uh, way around this problem. One way around that we proposed recently, um, yeah, fortunately I don't have the reference, but it's, um, you know, simple-minded. Essentially you map uh, fermions onto spins and then you use the spin Hamiltonian to find the ground state. This can be done using the Jordan Minner mapping, for example, or uh, other things. Uh, but this kind of approach is not essential, not always, uh, you know, sensible uh, because uh, um, uh, typically maps uh, a local Hamiltonian, fermionic Hamiltonian, for example, if you have a Hubbard model, say, to a very non-local spin Hamiltonian that takes into account these exchanges. And this is not uh, the best uh, thing you can do if you have symmetries like translations and other things in the, in the system. So um, essentially combining these two, let's say, for example, rotational translational symmetry and fermionic symmetries in, at once in the most general neural network, this is, uh, I would say, an open problem. I see. And a very Thank important you. one. Yeah. <laughs> very nice. Okay, any more questions? Anybody? 
Okay, I have one more then, <laughs> the last one, which is which is on your second part. So you, you spoke about your hope of being able to replace quantum computers with classical neural networks to a certain extent. And also you mentioned that this is a very much an open problem and it's not clear which for which applications this could be done and for which ones it's just impossible. Do you have any intuition for what kind of problems would very likely have an approximate solution of that type? Yeah, so um, uh, yes, so so if your task is uh, um, performing a random uh, quantum circuit, <laughs> which is uh, a task that uh, yeah, I was thinking about one, <laughs> unfortunately very popular these days. Um, then uh, uh, I, mean, you, I mean, you must be aware of the fact that there is no way you can uh, you can approximate that efficiently with any uh, you know. Uh, dimensional reduction scheme okay um, so so this means that um, if your process is, is intrinsically random you cannot compress it essentially because uh, we are going uh, if you want uh, at the beginning i mean i, I had this slide the world of this green region so now what we are doing if you do a quantum circuit is that we are going beyond this green region so we are going in a region where instead of having you know cats dogs and people we have monsters okay and we don't want monsters, but we want physical states. So physical states are not random, typically. Uh, and uh, in this sense, uh, uh, your task, your quantum task, uh, should not be about describing uh, random things. So if it is about describing the ground state of a physical Hamiltonian, then I would say that there is hope we can simulate the resulting quantum state. Yes, it's, it's, it's physics again that saves you in a sense, or the structure that's inherent to physics that makes it possible. Yeah, so exactly, precisely. I mean, if your state is random, uh, there's no way you can compress it down yeah. to a low dimensional representation. So this is, uh, this is clear. Um, yeah. I mean, even if you try to learn that state with another quantum computer, it's, it's actually the same. I mean, that's the point I want to make. So even if you parameterize your state with another quantum circuit and you try to learn the output of a random circuit, then, uh, you know, in all likelihood, I think that you won't be able to learn it, uh, even if you're using the most powerful uh, quantum ansatz in that case. It's really a matter of, uh, of trying to learn something which has no structure, which is universal, does not depend on the, yeah. on yeah. the answers that you're trying to use. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Great, thanks a lot. Okay, there's one more question here in the chat window. <laughs> Uh, by Alexei, who is asking, just out of curiosity, how the idea of using RBMs, how, how, did, you, how did you come up with the idea of using RBMs in the first place? What was the hint there? Um, so, yeah, um, essentially, <laughs> that's a good point. Um, well, it's one of the easiest, uh, I mean, if a physicist gets interested in, uh, in uh, neural networks, the first thing you you, you find uh, are uh, neural networks that are based uh, on uh, on energy models, so-called energy models. Um, essentially, because these were designed and written by physicists, and also the papers that you find uh, are written in in, a term, in ways that physicists can understand. So the first time I, I got interested in, uh, in neural networks, um, uh, it was kind of natural to, instead of going directly into deep networks, uh, deep, deep learning, I, I, I mean, I, I read what was easier for me to understand that were essentially Boltzmann weights. Uh, and uh, that's why I, mean, I, I got interested in RBMs. There is, I mean, I love RBMs, but again, I mean, at some point we, uh, we ditched them and we moved on to, um, to deeper states, unfortunately, because they are also more expressive, as you've seen from the results. But it's clear, it's true that RBMs are nice because it allows you also to do a lot of analytic uh, calculations that you can't do with, uh, with deep states. Okay, great. So if there's no more questions, then let me thank you once again on behalf of the entire audience for the wonderful talk. I learned a lot. So thank you. thanks very much. And the recording will be available on YouTube very soon for those who want to come back. Thanks a lot. Thank and you. Goodbye. Goodbye, see you next week. <laughs>